starting with the uh, standing on the on the steps. My son watched me do this. Okay, so did Samantha witness this? Samantha saw it. Who knows where she's buried besides you and Samantha? Just us. Just you two? Yeah. Phoenix and Claire, just five years old, endured a life marred by relentless abuse. Her spirit withered away in the confines of a basement while the world turned a blind eye to her suffering. Phoenix's tender existence was plagued by heinous acts. She was shot with a BB gun and made to eat her own vomit. Her stepfather, Wes McKay, would often play a game called Choking the Chicken, where he would choke Phoenix until she lost consciousness. As the final fatal assault claimed Phoenix's life, McKay and Phoenix's mother, Samantha Kamach, sealed her fate by wrapping her fragile body in plastic and burying her remains. But their wickedness did not end there. For nine months, they collected welfare payments with Phoenix listed as the dependent until their twisted charade was exposed. The following is a breakdown of a portion of Wes McKay's interrogation. She was in your life, right? Yeah. She was in your life. But because of whatever was going on in life, pressures, medication, whatever it may be, things got a little crazy. One of the first things that stands out is the seating proximity between the detective and McKay. They are very close and there are no barriers between the two. You can see this in any interview conducted by Oprah Winfrey. This is how she connects with the person she's interviewing, how she gets them to tell their deepest secrets on national television. This is how she's known for getting people to an emotional state where they tell it all. This is the same strategy the detective is employing. Right? Did you mean to do that to her? Did you mean to go that far? Or was it one of those situations where a nice guy made a mistake? Wesley. Did you mean to do that to, to Phoenix? Did you mean to do that purposely? Or was it just something that was beyond your control? Murdering a five-year-old girl and hiding her body is a very hard crime to confess to. One of the most powerful strategies a detective can employ is empathy. Not excusing McKay's actions, but empathizing with him, suggesting McKay is a good guy who made a mistake. The other strategy is shifting the blame from McKay to something else, an external factor that was out of McKay's control. Did you? Did you do that on purpose? Because if you did that on purpose, I can't understand. I can't understand. Did you do that to her on purpose? Or was it something that was beyond your control? This continual tap ensures that McKay is paying attention. Nobody controlled it. Nobody controlled it? Who controlled it? Who controlled it, man? You're a good man. You are. Who controlled it? Huh? Who controlled it, man? She didn't have to do, she didn't, she didn't have to die like that. Harry, do you agree? Yes. It's horrible, eh? You know what, I'm glad I see you like that because you know what it tells me you have feelings. You care. I'm happy to see you like that, man. Because you care, I know you do. That's why I'm sitting here with you. You care. You do, you're a good man. Doesn't matter what anybody says, you're a good man. Notice the detective touching McKay's shoulder in an encouraging way. In any situation, when someone is under stress, cortisol rises. A sympathetic pat on the back, holding someone's hand, rubbing their shoulder could release oxytocin, which helps combat cortisol. This is another thing that Oprah Winfrey does as she makes her interviewees comfortable opening up. You hey, are. How come it happened? Just, we know what happened. We know what happened. Why did it have to happen? I don't know. You don't know? Do you regret it? I can't think right now. I know. Do you regret what happened? Tell me you do. Do you regret what happened? Do you? Whatever I did in my whole life, I regret it. Yeah. If you could change one thing in your life, what would you change right now? Right now? Huh? I know my lawyer advised me to say nothing. I know. But you know what? All the lawyers do that. And that's right. That's that's your legal obligation. But you know what? There's You have values that that are speaking out. You have values. Now, before you freak out about the lawyer comment, let me explain how this was not a request for an attorney. In Davis versus United States, the courts ruled that a suspect's request must be unambiguous or unequivocal. They must clearly state they want an attorney. 
McKay's statement, I know my lawyer advised me not to say anything, is not a clear request for an attorney. It's not even a request. Now, before you beat me up in the comment section that this is not a United States case, you're absolutely right. However, Canadian case law, Clarkson versus the Queen, states that a clear and unequivocal waiver is essential. Now, I'm not an expert in Canadian case law, but my assumption, based on the fact that the statement stood, is that Canada and the United States are similar in that aspect. Right? There's things that you need to get off your chest. And I know, that's why I sat, sat here with you this long. I know, I could have walked out right away, but I know what you're about. I know you feel bad. I can see the tears, and that tells me a lot. I'm not judging you, okay? I'm not. I'm not judging you at all, and I won't. I know you've had a shitty life, okay? I know you've had a shitty life, and I don't expect you to be perfect. What? I just want to worry about my children. I know you do. If you notice, McKay is in an acceptance phase where he has psychologically accepted what he's done and may be considering telling some form of the truth, whether it's the full truth or a watered down version. This can be recognized by McKay burying his face in his hand, crying and curling into a modified fetal position by bringing his knee into his chest. Although McKay hasn't confessed yet, it's important the detective recognize this and continue to employ the same strategies that got McKay to this point. I just worry about my children. I know you do, I know you do. And you know what? I know you do, and that tells me a lot. You should be concerned. If you weren't concerned with them, if you weren't concerned about them right now, I, I, I don't know what I would think about you. I know you're concerned. You had two kids, two beautiful kids, right? Rain and Damien. They must mean the world to you, right? Yeah. They do, I know they do. I don't know. I see them again. Oh, come on. Hey, look at me. You will see them again. Don't say that. You'll see them again, okay? You know what? You've taken a big step here, okay? You've taken a monster leap. All right? That is awesome. You are you are a decent fella, whether you think so or not, okay? Okay? Hey. Hey. I, I don't I don't have any animosity against you, okay? All right? You did a good thing, okay? Hey. Yeah. It was Get it out. And I tried to save her. Yeah, what'd you do? I tried to give her CPR. Yeah. And what happened? She come to No. That must have been hard, eh? That must have been hard. I feel for you, man. Yeah. I, that made a big mistake. I know. But you know what? I got paid for it, so. But you know what? You know what? You're owning up to it, right? Right? The good fellow that you are, you are owning up to it. You realized you made a mistake. Right? Yeah. You did make a mistake. You did, and you know it, and, and you're talking about it, and that's awesome, that's great. The detective does a phenomenal job at taking McKay's negative objections or statements and turning them into a positive one. When Kay says, I made a mistake, it would be easy to say, yes, you did, because you're a sadistic shithead who deserves life in a cell with a really large man who hates baby killers. Instead, he maintains empathy and positively says things like, yes, you made a mistake, but you're talking about it, and that's awesome, and that's great. How, what, what was it that set you off that day? I mean, we all have pressures in our life, okay? Was it, was it medication? Was it stress? Was it people bothering you? Was it fear? Was it, what was it that set you off? I'm sorry? I don't know, I just, I don't know, it's, it's such a, it's, Tragic thing. It is a tragic thing, but you're taking the first step, right? As I said earlier, today is the first day of the rest of your life, right? Okay? It's important for you, and you know what? Your family will see it as like, wow, he's, he took ownership of this. He didn't try and hide. You know what? That tells so much about your character. 
Okay? Even though with all the crap that you've been through in your whole entire life, it tells so much, tells volumes, speaks volumes about your character. When did this happen? Hmm. When did this happen? You probably remember the date. No, I, I'm just thinking back here. Yeah, what my mother said. Yeah, take your time. She says, try not to get too involved in this relationship with Samantha. Yeah. How come? She was right. How come? Because she, she, she knows she knows her mom. Okay, your mom knows Samantha's mom. Samantha's mom. Yeah. yeah. Who's that? Uh, her name is Bertha. Yeah, okay. You're shipping short of her? Or no, behind? I'm here, no big. Yeah. Okay. So there's some stresses going on in your life, right? There was, uh, you know, when, when uh, I first told her to come and stay with me. And, right. You know, I didn't even know she had a, had a kid. You, know? oh, you didn't know Samantha? No, I didn't know she had a kid. Oh, really? Okay. But next thing you know, you know, she, I go to her mom's and her kid's there. And, right. and, Is that Phoenix you're talking yeah, about? Yeah. 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 This is her kid. But she was staying with her mom. Right. You know, I thought myself first time that Samantha was uh, just single. I didn't know she had any kids. And right. I don't know. She. She wasn't very. Um, I don't know. She wasn't very good with her child anyway. Samantha wasn't. No. No. How come? I don't know. I just don't know. Maybe the anger in her or something. Yeah. And then she get me and uh, you know tell her to shut up. That's not. Tell her to sh shut the hell up. Put right. it in the corner or whatever. Right. There was always a man that was starting with this kid. You know the biggest mistake was this. I mean I can't say that she moved in. The kid, the kid was like a mistake. Right. You no, know, she should have stayed with her grandparents. And um, I, I just lived this life of me, her, and you know. When, when I found out she was pregnant, you know, that shocked me and yeah. I uh, I tried so hard to, you know, you know, keep her happy. Right. You know, uh, but this tra tragedy has totally uh, turned my life. I bet it has. It must be weighing thin on your nerves, eh, since then? Well, it's, I don't know, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's kind of been bugging you. It has been. Yeah. Yeah, every night. Yeah, I bet it has. Sometimes uh, I listen to the music. One time yeah. I went like this and I heard Phoenix's name, you know, right. like it's out of the blue. Right. And uh, just kind of, you know, maybe think. Yeah. When is this going to occur? You know, I was scared. I bet you were. You know what? Yeah. Anybody in your shoes would be scared. If I would have been in your shoes, I would have, who knows, maybe I would have done the same thing. We, we don't think properly when in high stress situations, do we? We don't. Daniel was there. Yeah. Hey, I know he was there. He's so having, scared. He was having a tough time with this, man. He's having a tough time with this. I know. I told my son. Though. Yeah. I know. He's there watch this. Yeah. I know he was. I know he was. You know, it's sad about him standing there. Like, I'm sorry. Sam, if you stand there, she's all fucking like, look like she's happy or shit. Man. Really? How come? I don't know. Yeah. She was, uh, I mean, it happened. Right. How did it happen? But I don't know what the hell she said to you guys. Yeah. Well, she talked to one of the other officers. Earlier, we talked about shifting the blame. The detective recognizes that McKay has shifted the blame to his girlfriend, Samantha, so he capitalizes on this by asking who was responsible, McKay or Samantha. If McKay feels he can successfully blame Samantha, this strategy could work. You know, who's responsible here? You or Samantha? To me, uh, it is both of us. It's both of you? Yes. How is it, how is it both of your fault? Explain to me. I don't know, she would always tell me to tell that kid to keep quiet. Okay. That day, was she telling you to keep the kid quiet? Uh, no, she was downstairs. I think at the beginning she was downstairs because we were involved. Okay. To, to see my dad. Right. So she put her kid in the corner there. Is this in the basement? In the basement. Yeah. Okay, so she, she put her kid in the basement because the kid wouldn't keep quiet? Yeah. Yeah. She, she, she's a mean one. Right. Yeah. 
She had no heart. No way. When, I know she loves, she loves my babies. I bet she does. Well, she made a mistake, too. Yeah. Well, you both made mistakes. You're not perfect. Right? Yeah. I'm not papers. Well, you did a good thing by talking about it, though. You know that, right? Because the good person in you, right? The good person in you okay. is talking about it, right? Yeah, and, then, and you've had to keep this in for so long. I don't know how, like, I don't know how you, are you on special medication because since that incident? Or no? No, all of a sudden. But no? So, tell me, explain to me how it happened. I can't remember. Just... Try and remember for me, okay? Going back to the acceptance phase. At this point, it's very important that the detective employ certain strategies. Matching McKay's defeated demeanor by talking softly and showing empathy is pivotal at this point. Notice how softly the detective speaks. At some points, he's even whispering some of his words. If the detective changes his demeanor, becomes loud, starts rushing McKay to give more details, McKay could absolutely shut down at this point. I remember this, uh, I can't hear you. I don't even remember this. Uh, we just, I don't know, she put her in the corner, and she, I don't know what the fucking, she came out of the corner. And then Phoenix. I grabbed, yeah. Yeah. And then I grabbed it. I threw it on, on, the, on the clothes. There was a bag of clothes. I threw it on there. And I said, you know, listen to your mom. I said, so I, we went and we left. And then Daniel called me. She said that this little girl was a pretty good board. Yeah. If I came back, the sun was like this. Yeah, I know you did. That's what Daniel said. I said, I didn't revive her. Yeah. But it didn't work. And then I was scared. I bet you were. Then I told her. And then she said, let's, let's go bury her somewhere. Okay, right. We know that. <laughs> so we were after up and we went. We buried her. Yeah. Where'd you bury her? In the bush somewhere. Where? By the garbage dump. Yeah. Are you talking about uh, which garbage dump? I don't know. Somewhere you... If you go up the road somewhere, it's in the what garbage dump? And when you go towards on the, it's on the opposite south side or something, you have to go out the road. Who, who all went when you went to bury the child? Just me and Sam went. Yeah. What happened to Daniel? I told him to stay home. Yeah. I told him to move back. Yeah. So, try and explain to me. You said you buried. How deep is the body buried? It wasn't very deep. If you were to say in inches, how deep? Probably like a foot, foot and a half. Would you use to to bury? But I use a shovel. Yeah. What um, what did you did you put the baby into anything? What's that? Did you put the the child into anything? Plastic. Where'd you get the plastic from? It was downstairs. It was for the for the walls. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what vehicle did you use when you were out there? It's in a car. Is that the tempo? Yeah. Yeah? Where did you place the child in the car? In the, in the trunk. In the trunk. The detective brilliantly and nonchalantly gets McKay to provide more details so that he can obtain more evidence and learn where he can find Phoenix. It's very important the detective keep employing the same strategies that got him to this point. In the book, Influence, the psychology of persuasion, Dr. Ciadini writes about the commitment and consistency principle. Applied to an interrogational setting, once the initial admission has been obtained, it is easier for a suspect to be consistent by giving further statements. What time of day was this? This is in the evening. About what time? It was starting to get dark. Yeah. About nine, it was ten. Yeah. Did you ever go back there? No. You didn't go back and look? No. Is the body still there? I don't know. Well, if you didn't go back, would it still be there? I don't know. Is there anything on top of it right now? Just the soil, I guess. How about snow? Snow, yeah, there'd be snow on here, I guess. What direction in the dump? Is it right in the dump or is it on the outside? No, it's on the uh, dump in, in the bush somewhere. Okay. You'd be able to take me there? Yeah. Yeah? Really? Yeah. Okay. I appreciate that. I just want this over. I know you do. I know you do. And you know what? You're doing a good thing. I know you do. You're doing a good job. 
and uh, I'm going to spend the rest of my life in jail. Hey, hey, let's worry about dealing with the stuff right now, okay? All right? Okay? Right? The detective will now attempt to draw more details of the actual murder of Phoenix. Later, you'll see how the detective uses the principle of reciprocity during the process by getting McKay a tissue and a meal. The goal is to keep McKay talking and maintain the connection that was built between the two. So it was just you and Samantha? Yeah, went? me and Samantha. Who was actually responsible for, for causing the baby's death? I don't know. I don't know. Because I used to stagger with a, a VFI to, and one time they fucking, she had a fucking cut on her head. And yeah. who was hitting her on the head? I said, yeah. So I said, I don't know. Well, you're the only one here. Daniel wouldn't do it. Right. Well, did Samantha do anything to her that day? Yeah. She, what she, did she, she always do? beats her up. How does she beat her up? She fucking hits her. Yeah. I tried so hard not to do it, you know. I know, I know. Try so hard. Yeah. I don't want to play ball with I know. Samantha because, you know, we're both involved in this. And I, I see her do it as my responsibility. She, you know, she saw me do this too, and I, she, it's her responsibility too, right? Mm -hmm. But, so when you talk about who is responsible for causing the baby's death, was it you or was it her? I don't, I don't know. You know, I don't know. Like I said, after she was fine, and you phoned me up and said that the baby's not a girl, it's not breathing. So right. Where were you when, when Daniel called you? Yeah, my dad's. Okay. And I drove as fast as I could, and then I went right down the stairs, and she was just lying there, and then I tried to resuscitate her to like, give her the, because uh, I took uh, that training for uh, emergency respond unit. Right. And uh, I was trying to revive her. Okay, but... You said you, you talked about earlier that you did CPR? Yeah. Now, just explain what CPR is to me so I know that... Well, I, I, I put, uh, put her head up like this, and then I just trying to blow her mouth right. look at the chest. And then um, I, I kind of gave her the, this thing here. The chest compression? Yeah, not, not too hard. But no. No, and I, I, tried, and I tried to revive her again, and it didn't, it didn't work. No. So I don't know how long she was like that. How long did you try doing it for? About five, ten minutes. And oh. it was, I couldn't do it any longer okay. because. It, well, where was Samantha when you were doing she this? Was standing at the, uh, she was standing on the, on the steps. My son watched me do this. Okay, so did Samantha witness this? Samantha saw it too. Yeah. She, she seemed to try to try to fight with that little girl. Yeah. So he saw me do so this. You know, I tried to make a little bit more. Yeah. Where did this happen exactly? I mean, I have an idea. Okay. Which, which, where did this exactly happen in Fisher River? Yeah. And uh, we used to live at this house on a uh, reserve. Right. And we were paying rent for it. This girl named uh, Angela Murdoch. It's her house. It's her house, but you were paying rent yeah. to her? Yeah. We okay. Paying rent to her. But it was a reserve house? Yeah. Okay. Wasn't it wasn't really uh, the best place to go because you can tell it's going to be cold. Right. Because it was windows smashed out a bit, and we had stuff covered, plastic covering the windows. And okay. All right. So did it have a house number? No, it's uh, the diamond one seventy four or something. One seventy four. Like what that. color was it? Uh, it's a bluish, whitish house, blue and white. Yeah. What? And I know sometimes uh, the reserves had a road. What road was it on? What's it called? On Main Highway. Main Highway? Yep. Okay. Do you have Kleenex? Yeah, okay. Kleenex? Uh, some Kleenex? We'll get you some Kleenex. There's, uh, there's some food outside the door there. Are you interested in eating anything? Yeah. Or no? Just a little bit of Yeah? I don't know if you like McDonald's or what? Does it matter? Well, you know what? You can't change the facts, right? You're done. I wish it was. I know. I know. Wish it would never happen to you. I know you do. I know you do. Take it up for some other thought. Kill anybody. But like, if nobody does, nobody does, unless you're a serial killer. I know you're not. Serial killers go out and do that. It's the people that make mistakes. And you're the guy that made the mistake that day. At this stage, the detective employs a compare and contrast strategy where he compares McKay to a serial killer. 
Although McKay's crime is extremely heinous, the way the detective delivers this strategy allows McKay to temporarily feel that he's not such a bad murderer, thus making it easier to continue the conversation. You know, I do feel a little better than I before here. Goodbye. I know you do. It takes a load off your off your shoulders. I know. <laughs> Maybe not if she can rest in peace. That's a good thing you said. Maybe she can. Maybe she can. I hope for I hope for your sake she can. Hey. Probably not going to be all that great, Dave. Eh? It's uh, cold. But, whoops. So listen. When did this happen? You must have that day. That day must be embedded in your mind. It's June 11th. How do you remember June 11th? Because that's the day we buried her. Yeah? Did you write it down somewhere? No, it's just stuck in my head. Yeah? June 11th, what year? 2005. Okay. All right. So who knows where she's buried besides you and Samantha? Just us. Just you two? Yeah. Okay. So I don't even know why. Then. All of a sudden, I think sorry for her and I thought, oh, but did they find the body or? Mm -hmm. Well, Phoenix had disappeared, right? Yeah. You just put two and two together and you realize something's, something's wrong, right? Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, I mean, you're doing some silly stuff, getting other kids involved, you know, right? I didn't want this, my son to see that. No, I know you didn't. Nobody wants to, I know. 